What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLP FM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archive at madnessradio.net. Welcome to Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall, and today we are speaking with Stephen Morgan. Stephen is an activist and advocate in the mental health system as a peer specialist in Georgia and Vermont. He is diagnosed with a bipolar disorder, but that's not a label that he identifies with, and we'll be talking about that more with him. And he's also a musician and photographer. Um, Stephen is on the line with Madness Radio from Atlanta, Georgia. Stephen, thanks a lot for joining us today on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. For sure. Yeah, it's really it's um it's really cool to have you on the show because you're you're actually kind of like a celebrity now. You were you were in the New York <laughs> Times a few weeks ago, right? <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, I had seen that uh, the New York Times was running these series called Patient Stories with uh, different illnesses, and um, I actually contacted the woman that's heading up those stories and asked her if she would be willing to run my story of being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And I actually, I didn't know if they were going to really take me up on that because I had sort of mentioned that I wasn't a quote unquote good patient and I kind of viewed things differently, but I felt that I at least had somewhat of a perspective that needed to be shared. And um, well, I'm really glad that you did because um, people can go to the New York Times website and listen to that um, audio link, and we'll, we'll have it linked from the Madness Radio um, website, so you can just find it through that. But it's it's really great to have you there because you kind of jump out as the one lone voice in the wilderness of actually having a different perspective and not a uh, medical medications are the only way disease model perspective. So it was really great to have you be um, part of that. And I think it's really reflects the way that the culture is beginning to open up a little bit to greater diversity um, in what is uh, considered, you know, mental disorders or mental illness, and and listening to people who don't fit the the good patient mold, as you as you say. So congratulations on that. That was great to to see to hear about that. Yeah, thank you very much for sure. So let's um let's talk about you know your experiences. I mean, we uh, mentioned that you're diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and what is what does that mean? I mean, how did you kind of get into the mental health system? How did you get that? diagnosis and how did you first um how did you first um sort of have an experience with uh, madness or some kind of extreme state <laughs> wow <laughs> <laughs> right just Huge tell us questions. the whole story uh, yeah tell us the whole story here yeah <laughs> i'll try and give the bullet point uh, a version but yeah i mean I, I you know i find that storytelling in itself is al- always um kind of changes with the the acquired wisdom that you have and so I, uh, my story constantly is changing. And right now it's sort of in flux because I'm still trying to connect a lot of dots and uh, make webs of, of meaning for, for the things that have happened to me in my life. But um, I think that, you know, from an early age, I definitely carried around a lot of uh, rage within me and stuff like that. And um, over time it sort of manifested and uh, I started to become very demoralized and disconnected for periods of time. And I would, I would become very suicidal and whatnot, and um, and then I would sort of come out of that and have these highs and, and whatnot. And that went on for many years without me reflecting on um, on it being any kind of, uh, I guess, psychological problem. I, it just was who I was. My family wasn't very uh, medically oriented, so I never went and saw like a therapist or psychiatrist or anything like that. But um, when I was about 22, I ended up in a relationship with a woman who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And... Um, I started learning more about it from her, and um, I read Kay Jameson's Touched with Fire, and it sort of had all these descriptions that really fit me, and I really, um, I, w- I was struggling. I I'd, I'd just gone through these periods of time where I wasn't sure if I could keep handling going going down that far. So um, I told myself if I came out of the, the, the recent period of depression that I was going through at the time that, um, that I was going to... Uh, see a psychiatrist and, and whatnot. And so I actually kind of brought myself there and, um, and was quickly diagnosed. I mean, there's a checklist you know, where you check off uh, yeah. a, a different symptoms. And, and um, That's really interesting because I think that's happening more and more um, in the culture is that the kind of um, 
people learn about a diagnosis through advertising or through the culture or through the media or they read a book and they start to consider that it has application to them and then they go out seeking seeking help based on based on that which is re- which is relatively kind of a new uh, a new thing I think and it's part of the the way in which the culture gets a lot more familiar um, with uh, and uses more of a psychiatric and mental health framework but you mentioned something Stephen that was really interesting um, you mentioned that it, it kind of had these uh, the swings between the suicidal and then the highs kind of had this origin in rage that you said what say a little bit more about that what do you mean by that well, it's it's. I mean, it's hard for me to point to exactly um, what what that emotional state uh, was, or or still is. And you know, I mean, I can I can I guess look at my past and I can see um, different elements of tr- of trauma in some areas, and then I can see just my own spirit in in, in other areas. Um, the sort of rage, I, I think, I just I carried around a lot of self destruction. I mean, I can remember from a very young age wanting to smash everything in my house and run away. I had this fantasy of running away to, to Florida on a bus or whatever. And, I, I mean, I was like nine or ten years old. Um, and so I just I, I carried that around. Um, and I think that there's a lot of reasons why. And, you know, I can point a lot of fingers outward, but I also want to take responsibility and point some of it just towards my own spirit and who I am as a person. Um, but I think that, you know, that sort of over time – and I mean, this is something that I'm sure your audience and you are very, you guys talk about a lot, but we live in a very sick culture in a lot of ways. And, and um, that asks us to conform to certain norms and, and um, ideas that are not in harmony with everyone's interior space and especially was in, in harmony with mine. And so things like high school um, were, were very, very, very hard for me. And I, I think I increasingly became disconnected um, as I tried to fit certain molds and, you know, I, I just fell off. And I, I struggled with a lot of obsessions and compulsions, too. That was, pro- you know, primarily the hardest thing. I mean, a lot of, I, I think, um, uh, my rage would, would end up coming out in these, these needs, I guess, for, for perfection and stuff and, you know, tapping in patterns and stuff like that. Um, does that kind of answer that? <laughs> yeah. how, how did it fit with the, um, because you, you mentioned the rage, and how does it fit with like going into a suicidal down state and then coming up to a more high state? Because I think when people when people think about like those swings from a depressive to a manic, they kind of just think of it as this mysterious cycle that just sort of exists. And then we think, oh, it must be biological. But you're suggesting that it actually has a kind of an emotional basis underneath it that's that's driving it for you yeah i mean i think that so i actually got a lot more insight into this recently because um earlier this year i started to have a lot of my rage come back up and um i could deal with it and because i'm not taking medications anymore so i could deal with it in a, in a much different way um and i think the insight around it that i had was is that for one it, you know our bodies carry around a lot of our experiences and things you know, trauma and other stuff gets stored in our body and um, it becomes released sometimes through that. And I think that what used to happen is I just wasn't in touch with the rage, and so it would overtake me, and um, I, and then I would try and sequester it, you know, to exist in, in, in whatever kinds of um, cultural and societal norms that, that, that were, were, uh, were demanding uh, of me. And I think that the sequestering it, um, would just push it down further, and then I would be demoralized, and then it would try and kind of penetrate me and break me through in, um, in different ways. Maybe it would haunt me in my dreams, or it would come through as obsessions and compulsions, or it would just come through as total destruction, um, and that would just end up sinking me lower and lower and lower. Um, and I think that the – I don't know how much it relates to sort of the higher end of things, um, but I can I definitely see it relating a lot to the lower end of things. So when I experienced it recently, though, I my my work was really to just I just felt it and and I used it and I listened to it and I said this is okay, and this is this is part of the human experience. You know, I'm not seeking happiness in my life. I'm seeking to be real with my feelings and true to my feelings and true to who I am. And that's really, um, um, that's really interesting and that's so key. And so many people who have. Um, who are at a place where they're not taking medication and they're they're able to deal with and work with their inner states do report that you know it is about you know being really in touch with what you're experiencing emotionally and being able to express it and talk about it and recognize it 
and to not push it away because often if you just push it away or you ignore it, then it becomes the driving force for these kind of out of control states that get called symptoms and then lead people to think that they just have to, you know, do the entire psychiatric medication uh, approach. So it's really interesting that you've got that awareness and you're able to, to make that, that connection. You've done a lot of work on your, on yourself. So getting back to the, the story, we kind of, I kind of jumped in cause it's so, it's so fascinating to me, but I kind of jumped in when you were saying that you, you know, you had, um, I guess you talked to your girlfriend and then you went in and, and saw a psychiatrist and then you got the, the diagnosis. So what happened for you, for you then at that point? Well, my whole worldview changed. <laughs> I started to, uh, to see, see myself as having a chemical imbalance in my brain. And, um, I started to label a lot of my experiences as, as manic or depressed. I started to rewrite my history as having different clinical phases of, of mania and depression. Um, I, and I stopped sort of seeing the existential crisis of it and started to see it more as a medical problem. Um, so this was that when you were under the sway of the kind of medical psychiatric framework that you you now no longer subscribe to. Is that right? Right. And, you know, I mean, it's not any one person put this idea in my head. A lot of it was myself because I researched and the research that I found all had the same message, which is, you know, bipolar disorder is a medical condition like diabetes that you have to take medications for the rest of your life. And it's a chemical imbalance in your brain. And, um, you know, I mean, there's part of that is there, there's a relieving aspect to it. Um, but, but then part of it is, is very, um, it creates a lot of despair. And so, you know, as, as I started relabeling everything, I started to take that on. Um, I did that for about six or nine months, and then eventually, I think my sort of internal spirit said, no way, you're casting off this, um, this, this label. And I, I quit medications. I went and I jumped into a really intense job where I was teaching on, on um, Lakota Sioux land, and so it's like out of my element. And I ended up having a, a very rough time, and it sort of broke down. And when that happened, I really said to myself, you know, no, this is something that you really have. Um, this is really a problem that's going to be with you for the rest of your life. And that started as sort of a series of psychiatric hospitalizations, um, you know, and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that, where I actually started manifesting a lot of the behaviors that, that are, are, are part of this diagnosis, like, you know, um, self-destructive things would turn into the cutting and stuff like that. And um, So you really swung from the one, one extreme to the other and then back again. You started really not knowing what was going on. You, you, um, then you embraced the entire medical psychiatric framework of labeling yourself um, bipolar and seeing yourself as, as, a, as having a disease and a chemical imbalance. And then you just jumped out of that and said, forget it. This is not what I want. You get rid of the medication, and then that causes a huge amount of problems as well. Right. And then you kind of swing the other, the other direction. Yes. What was when you mentioned that it was relieving to when you first embraced the view of yourself and started to understand yourself as having a disease and a chemical imbalance. You said that it was relieving. Say a little bit more about how it was a relief to to do that. Well, part of it was relieving. I think that what was most relieving was actually with the obsessive compulsive stuff. Um, I mean, I don't have a problem even now saying that ob obsessive compulsive behavior is probably some, some uh, things going on in my brain in a, in a very uh, physical way that has sort of gotten wired over time. doesn't mean they can't be unwired or unraveled. Um, that was actually really relieving. I mean, you know, when you're looking under your bed three times, or, or tapping in patterns of nines and 27 and believing if you don't do it that your grandmother is going to die in a plane crash and straightening things for three or four hours at a time and stuff like that, or, or feeling like the pressure to ask certain questions that are, like, um, that are not um, socially appropriate or whatever and then doing it and embarrassing yourself. When you're doing that like for years and years and years, to be told that that's something that other people experience and it's, it's sort of a brain problem and that that it, it's not, you know, a character flaw is actually, was for me at least relieving. So you don't um, have to sort of blame yourself and you don't have to kind of have these, these terrible compulsions and then at the same time have this terrible guilt and sense that you're a failure because you can't control them. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, don't, I, ne I didn't necessarily blame myself for them, but I think that it was just relieving to be able to point to something for it. Right, to um, have, a, have some clarity, have some understanding. And then yeah. also, the, I guess, the promise of control and being able to overcome it as well. 
to, yes, to some extent. So I, I mean, it, it, there can be that can be a helpful platform for for understanding experiences, you know, and and um, and and it, and it was for me for for some of them, but but not for others, you know. Hmm. So you so you said you you know you you tried to just throw the medications away and just turn your back on the entire problem, and then you had some hospitalizations that really showed you that this is serious and and something you really need to to look at. What what happened there? Uh, a lot, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I just sort of fell apart. I think that everything that was within me, I just hadn't, you know, I, I didn't have access to it in the same ways. Maybe I had erected sort of mental walls over time, um, that sort of blocked off fragments of myself. And, um, and so I was split, you know, in some ways. And, um, I think that, you know, I just kept on being haunted by the, the stuff that I was cutting off in, in different ways. And um, I went through a period of time where um, I wasn't working and, you know, I, I was just, you know, it was hospitals and, and, and just really, really bad off. And um, for, for that period of time, I, uh, yeah, I really, subs- I, I, again, I subscribe to this whole um, mental illness worldview and that, that, that explained my problems. Were you, swinging, were you swinging between the suicidal periods and the high periods at this time? Well, I, I was actually really pretty low for a long time, but then what happened was is I decided, okay, I, I had a filmmaking degree. I was like, I'm going to make a film about bipolar disorder. This is going to be my, my project. And I had just gotten out of a relationship, so it was a way of avoiding sort of dealing with feelings of abandonment and all this stuff. And so I sort of I started pushing myself in that direction. I kind of allowed myself to get really um, to get high, and, and and I started spinning in a lot of ways. And um, anyways, through that pro- through that effort, I actually ended up doing volunteer work because um, I wanted to meet people with these experiences and um, you know see if they were interested in this documentary film. And uh, one woman that I ended up meeting um, and doing volunteer work with, she ended up uh, recommending that I, I do this Georgia Certified Peer Specialist Project, um, which is what I got into. But it, it was a, you know it was a while away. I ended up crashing and ended up in the hospital again. But the, that hospitalization, I got out and I said to I said you know what um, this is I, I'm going to do whatever I can. Um, to stay out of the hospital uh, forever because the experience was just awful. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, so many people have such bad experiences. Not not everyone. I have talked to people who had positive hospital experiences, but most people have really bad experiences. What were some of the things that, that happened or what were some of the, the bad parts for you? Well, I, I think that, you know, <laughs> hospitals, and I, I've since worked in hospitals, so it's, it's interesting to be on the other end, but hospitals... Um, it's amazing to me that we think that those are places of healing or that that's where we send people that are in, in these intense um, crises um, because a hospital to me is just almost the opposite. I mean, you have locked doors, so your freedom is taken away from you. You can't go outside. I need to be outside a lot. Um, you, uh, you, you're in the morning, you, you point to these pictures of, of emotions or whatever and say, I feel that way today, and you set a goal for the day. I mean, how humiliating is that, you know? And at the end of the day, you talk about, did you meet your daily goal? That's not life. That's sort of this really weird, um, bizarre, uh, almost like elementary school type stuff. So it can be very humiliating. You have your shoelaces taken from you um, because they don't, you know, there's no trust that, that you, can, you won't kill yourself. Everyone else there is really drugged up and, and totally down too. And, um, you know, people kind of talk to you as if you're sick and um, you're not met with the kind of human connection that I think we need. I mean, that's the one thing that I think the hospital, or that, that I need at least in crisis more than anything, is I need a human being that cares about me to sit there with me and be with me for hours on end. And that is totally unavailable in hospital settings because uh, workers are swamped or, or whatever and they're running around. It's just not there. And um, even with your peers, you know, you, you might not find people that, that are interested in that or that you can connect to. So, I mean, that whole experience, you know, made me worse off, um, at least that hospitalization did. And when I got out of there, I just said, I cannot, you know, I'm going down the wrong path. I had applied for SSI, so I almost went into the whole disability game. And, um, you know, I I just, I realized that if I didn't change my life dramatically, that I was going to end up a mental patient for life. And um, even though after the hospital, I was still paralyzed with, um, with my with really intense emotions for months afterwards, I, I just pushed through. I, I, I said, "This is going to get better. This is going to get better. This is going to get better." 
Where do you, that's really important, the, the kind of um, inner strength that you had in able to believe in yourself and just say, look, I can't, I can't do this. Um, I have to do something different. Where do you think that that inner strength uh, comes from? <laughs> well, if you, if you ask an astrologer, <laughs> it's, it's all over my astrology chart. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and I, and I believe in stuff, some stuff like that. I think part of it's my innate spirit. I mean, I really do have, it's a double-edged sword. Everything has a shadow side. I have a, a, a spirit towards um, uh, resiliency, but the shadow side is also, you know, very much towards destruction or self-destruction. Um, so you just got lucky with kind of these inner resources that were innate and part of who you are, your birthright, your fate, and they really kind of kicked in at the right moment to sort of help you avoid some pretty dangerous traps that you that you could have fallen into. Yeah, I, I think that that's part of it, you know. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I that's probably my best my best judgment of it is that a lot of it was just sort of internally who I am. I mean, it's ever since I was a little kid, I was a very curious and, and determined individuals in, in, in a lot of uh, ways. So. This is more of a philosophical question, or maybe it's more of a advocacy and peer support question but do you think because I, I agree with you I mean it seems like some people their stories they just talk about just this inner strength that they had or some inner resource or maybe even they got lucky or circumstances or people came and helped them at just the right moment and it was their fate to go in a certain direction and not another one do you think it's possible to teach that or for people to learn to cultivate that that part of themselves, or is it just a question of the the roll of the dice and who gets who gets lucky and who doesn't? Well, I think it's a million dollar question, <laughs> and I think that um, I, I think at, at some level, um, you know, if you look at, for instance, if science, if you're going to approach some of this um, through science, um, some of the science around people that that are successful without medications does indicate that that people um, that have better quote unquote internal resources or um, pre-morbid uh, favorable, you know, achievements or personality types um, seem to be more successful without medications. And so I, I think that there, maybe there's an element of, in, um, you know, innateness, but at the same time, I, I do think that people, I have changed so much in my life in so many directions, and, um, and, and I've seen other people change dramatically too. I think that people can learn um, – certain in internal resources that allow them to be more resilient and that, um, that allow them to, to progress in certain ways. I also think, though, that, that there are certain folks that have different temperaments. We shouldn't expect everyone to be determined, you know, um, individuals that, 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 that want to move on with their life and, you know, and accomplish and all this other stuff. That's not for everybody. And so it's the society and the culture's responsibility and family's responsibilities to provide an environment that brings out um, other people's um, strengths, uh, um, too, even if they don't meet that certain criteria for, like, you know, um, good prognosis or whatever. Stephen, that's such an important point that you're, you're making because I think that the model – that we um, that we're given so much is that the individual on their own as a separate you know independent uh, person has to kind of take care of themselves and everything is all about you know do you have the strength within yourself do you have the discipline are you willing to try are you you know can you take care of yourself can you feed yourself can you um, work and I think for a lot of us that's reasonable but whatever happened to just helping each other and taking care of each other and and if someone doesn't have those resources within themselves, what about creating an environment around them that supports them, that doesn't just say, okay, get your life together, but actually helps the person from the outside and doesn't assume that because they can't like pull themselves up by their, their own uh, bootstraps, um, that it's their struggle that they have to learn how to do that on their own. We have these in, in incredible individualistic framework for what healing is and for what success is in mental health and I just think it's I think you're absolutely right it's just unrealistic many many people are much more about community about interdependence about relying on each other and it's completely reasonable um, to uh, consider that those people have different needs that are about the kinds of support and environment that they're in rather than just relying on them as individuals to take care to take care of themselves 
Yeah, it, absolutely. And I, you know, I was writing about this the other night, and I was saying a treatment plan shouldn't, you know, have um, shouldn't shouldn't suggest um, tightening the the screws and the cultural machinery that crushed your soul in the first place. And, and that's a very, I guess, abstract way of saying that, you know, not everybody's treatment plan should be going back to work, <laughs> you know, or it shouldn't be, uh, it, it, we have to look at diversity. And I also think that that's a wonderful opportunity for larger cultural and social change. I mean, if we start looking at people breaking down as an indication of, of the whole, then we can start to say, well, how can we all sort of, um, uh, uh, change in, in a way that everyone is is feeling in touch with their own unique voice, and um, it, I, I just I, and I don't see a lot of of that. That that's what worries me. Will is that I think our, our society in a lot of ways is becoming more and more like automatic and more and more like molded, as if you have to meet a certain um, you know I, ideal for capitalist enterprise. Um, and we're, we're saying to people that they, they have to meet that. So if someone is, hates their job and they're totally upset about it, we don't say, you know, quit your job or, or, or change your job or, um, or change the work environment or, you know, be an activist about it. We say take Prozac and go back to your job and you won't care. You know, and, and I, I think that that's just extremely problematic. <laughs> yeah, it's very much like a machine that the part is broken down, so we have to fix the part to get it to fit back into yeah. the machine. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio, and we are speaking with uh, Georgia activist and advocate Stephen Morgan. He is uh, labeled with bipolar disorder and has been an organizer with the peer specialist movement in Georgia and Vermont. So just to, you mentioned um, some of the research, and um, you've written quite a bit about recovery and about the mental health system, and I wanted to point people to an article that you have on the Icarus Project website, which is the Icarusproject.net. And it's just an overview of some of the real basic aspects of the research, what the research says about mental health and, and mental illness diagnosis and, and medication. And it's a great it's a great resource. It's up on the articles section and we'll include a link to it on the Madness Radio um, website page for this um for this program and I encourage people to to check it out. Um so let's see. So getting back to the the story you were saying that you were faced with this possibility of going on on social security disability you were recognizing that you were in danger of becoming a, a a lifelong mental patient that you were really being pushed in that direction and then somehow you know this resource inside of you this spiritual or resilience or part of your destiny your fate or who you are as a unique individual really kind of kicked in to help you say no i want to do something something different. I really want to take care of myself and avoid that, that other direction. So how did that then happen? What did you actually do that, that got you to the point of being off medication and being where you are now in, in your life? Well, there was a couple of sort of really important things. One of them is I, I had started to read a lot of Eastern spiritual texts. You know, I, I my friend had recommended the Bhagavad Gita and then I read the Tao Te Ching, and then I started to read a lot of Zen Buddhism and stuff like that. And that stuff spoke to me in a much different way than my um, my Southern Christian upbringing had. And um, so I started to become very interested in that. And when I got out of the hospital, I also said, I'm going to do therapy. I'd never done therapy in my life. So how did those Eastern spiritual texts speak to you exactly? Like, what 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 is this kind of connection that you started to make? Well, I... <laughs> I, you know, in a lot of ways, these texts um, promote almost like an opposite way of living than, than Western society. Um, I think that I was originally really attracted to the idea of letting go of expectations of things. Um, and of, of, you know, I mean, that's where I sort of started with it. I thought, wow, that's a really interesting idea. You know, we're, we're taught in a society to have dreams and goals and and you know that things need that we need to be happy. We need to achieve happiness and success and all this other stuff. And I loved how it sort of started off with the idea of that those kinds of expectations end up becoming um, illusions, or, or they are delusions that that um, that will, will inevitably cause a lot of suffering. Um, so I started I started there with that stuff. Now, how is that how is that uh, helpful? Because people could say, oh, well, that's isn't that just giving up on life and and no longer having any goals or ambitions and just kind of like, uh, uh, you know, resignation? 
Yeah, I think that that's the that's the paradox in a lot of ways. Like some people think that Buddhism and stuff like that is nihilistic, um, and, and it, it's not really. I, I think that um, the, the paradox is really that that when you let go of expectations, when you um, when, when you let go of some of these illusions, what happens is you get more in touch with your your true nature, and then you learn how to just be. And just being looks like a million different things. I mean, that's the beauty of life. Is life is variety and it's diverse. But when you get in touch with your own true nature, um, it's not like you know, it's not like letting go of expectations. Suddenly, you know, you abandon your family, you don't have a job, you know, and, and you go live in the desert for two years. I mean, yeah, some people do do that, but but it's more about getting back in touch with your true nature, and that looks like a million different things. So it's it's not about avoiding um, reality or or society or whatever. It's it's about coming closer um, to what is and and what is not. So it's maybe a more kind of acceptance of where things are and maybe using a lot less effort and maybe spending more time with what's actually happening um, and in the moment rather than pushing yourself for something in the future? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think that um, I think that there's that, that whole element. But all, all of this, in, so this all ties into actually where I was going to go with the, uh, with the therapist because I ended up getting into therapy for nine months with someone who who had a, um, a background in like Jungian psychology, and um, you know, and he was very a very spiritual man as well. And I think those nine months with him were were some of the most significant times of transformation for me. Um, and he, you know, we our work was was very different than the work that I was used to. Um, you know, uh, from like a workbook or with a psychiatrist, our work was much more abstract and, and we dealt with, with dreams that I was having and we dealt with more like potentialities or, or these bigger questions. What does it mean to be a man, you know, um, uh, be a man in this world or, or what does it mean to be a, um, a human be- being with a, with a collective past? You know, that, that human beings are not like these isolated, I'm not like an American, just an isolated person in 2008. I mean, we've been evolving for hundreds of thousands of years, and that stuff is with us. It's in our blood. It's in our soul. What does that mean, you know? And um, I, I would start to explore these things in that context. And I tell you what, the, um, as I got in touch with some of these more um, uh, spiritual dimensions, and, and, and uh, especially with my dreams, I started to reconnect to sort of a source that I had lost connection with. I had believed that, um, you know, mental illness in a lot of ways defined me. And uh, because of that, I cut off a lot of aspects of, of, of myself that were, um, that, that were more metaphorical, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, but, you know, th- this man really validated uh, my, my connection to a different kind of source. And as I explored that, it, it, it would respond. I would start to analyze my dreams consciously during the daytime, for instance, and then at night they would respond with a different message. And it was sort of this, this dance back and forth. And um, that it propelled me towards towards a more holistic state and towards healing. And um, one of the things that that taught me is, oh my gosh, you know, like our uh, we are we are um, imbued with this incredible healing potential that's within us. And um, you, you know, I feel like that my dreams were uh, uh, acted with me with the same way that you know, like medications or therapy or, or whatever. Um, um, attempt to do, but in a much more profound way because they sort of healed the, the root as opposed to just the, the branches. Um, Did so. you have any really <laughs> big, significant dreams during this period that you might want to give us a, a short kind of summary of? Yeah, well, I had, I had lots of huge dreams, actually, but um, I would have themes, you know. I would, I would have themes of sharks, for instance. I'd be in the middle of the ocean, which is traditionally, like, you know, a symbol of the unconscious, or, or some people say it's the emotional world, but for me, I, I felt like it was really like um, the, the unconscious in a lot of ways, and, and the sharks would come and they would attack me, or, or I'd be really scared of them, but as I started to, to, to explore that, you know, I would start having different relationships with the sharks, or I would talk to them, and, um, you know, it ultimately culminated in me befriending the sharks. I actually had a party with them on a beach in one of my dreams, and, uh, and then they disappeared, and then I went hunting for them, and I couldn't find them. But, you know, I mean, it was amazing, like, how, how they became, like, a, a force unto themselves. Um, and, you know, they just, they just taught me things. And that, that's part of, you know, the whole archetypal psychology is that symbols and, and myth 
express something that we can't just describe in language. It's not. It's definitely not an evidence-based practice. <laughs> it's something that we can't we can't rationally approach because they're they're by their very nature um, uh, irrational. But um, you know, but they're also incredibly healing and beautiful and, and important, and they're important to, to human nature. Um, yeah, that's really amazing. So you have this, you have these the sequence of dreams where at first the sharks are coming after you, and then in the sequ- and then the next dream and the next dream you start to have a relationship with the sharks or to talk with the sharks, and then pretty soon you're partying with the sharks on yeah. the beach. I mean, that's a pretty amazing metaphor for changing a relationship to a part of yourself and befriending a part of yourself and then really sort of like making it more integrated, more who you are. And then I had this image of when you said you were, you were hunting for the sharks, which you couldn't find them. It's kind of like sharks are kind of like hunters themselves. You sort of like, you start to become a little bit more like a shark yourself. It's all very put together and integrated and there's more of a wholeness there. Absolutely. Yes. So what were some of the other things that helped you? You said that the, um, the, discovering Eastern spirituality was helpful. Doing the therapy with the Jungian therapist was helpful. What were some of the other things that helped you get to the point where you are now? Well, so at at that point, I also started working um, again. And I worked as a Georgia certified peer specialist, which is basically a a movement by people that that were diagnosed in the psychiatric system who have um, created this whole project to train and certify people with diagnoses and who are in recovery to then go work in the mental health system from um, an alternative perspective. And that alternative perspective is, you know, the quote unquote recovery model, which, which looks a lot different than the traditional medical model. And as I started to, um, to do that kind of work, I started to have something that was giving me a lot more meaning in my life. Um, I was working with people at a peer center every day and, you know, I was learning how to, to relate to people in different ways. Um, I also sobered up, which was which was very very significant because I had I had major problems with um, with drinking for a long time in my life, and um, and then later that year I I had a meditation experience that sort of altered the course of my life forever, and um, I think that that sort of began, you, you know, where I'm at today. <laughs> Well, I'd love to hear about the meditation experience, but before that, I mean, how did you how did you sober up? Because that's a that's a really dramatic uh, dramatic personal success that a lot of people aren't aren't able to get to that to that point. How did it how did it work for you? Well, I you know I've seen the destructiveness of alcohol in, in people around me, and I've seen it in myself, and that was one thing I, I always could just sort of point to. This is just not healthy. Um, two, you know, taking medications and drinking, that was one of the benefits of medications is my hangovers became about 10 times more severe. And so I really, it just started to physically become more and more toxic. And then three, I think I needed to have something that really um, gave me meaning in my life that, that I could rally around and focus on. And that was the work that I was starting to do. And when I started to do that work, I had less of a need um, to drink. And um, And then you know, finally, once I started to, to meditate, meditation is, uh, for me at least, has been so healing in so many ways. One of the things it's done is, is put me back in touch with my body and made me appreciate my body. And I don't necessarily want to put toxic stuff into my body. And I never felt like that before because I never, I didn't have, I, didn't, I wasn't in touch with, with, with you know, um, how my body would respond to substances and whatnot. Was that the significant meditation experience that you, you had that you mentioned? Yeah, well, that the, that experience in itself sort of started everything. But I mean, what had happened was is that I had flirted with meditation in the past. But then, one one night, I uh, you know I decided, okay, I really need to to try this um, again. And I sat in front of a, a white wall that was bathed in, in moonlight, and um, I you know. <laughs> I had a lot of energy come up and I, I remember thinking, you know, don't go with this energy flow, just observe it. And then I remember I had read earlier in the day that this, this you know, Zen master had said, you know, go with what comes in, in meditation. So I decided to sort of let it overtake me. And it had been strange because earlier that night I had, I had had a, I had seen, I had like hallucinated and seen a person um, in ancient, you know, Asian world be, becoming enlightened. And it was just this, like, it was like a, a symbol or something. And so I had that sort of on my mind too. That that there was, um, 
I don't know. It just it just made this experience more significant. And as I went with this sort of what was it again? It was a symbol of a of a person that you saw that you yeah. I saw this 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 man walking out of a house and and he smiled and I knew internally that that he had just attained enlightenment. Um, or and it was just I, I don't know. It just came to me, <laughs> and and so it was sort of. Uh, it, again, I'm speaking of, of stuff that's like more in symbology. There's, it's really ineffable in a lot of ways. It's hard to describe what that did for me, but internally it gave me some kind of, um, I don't know, it just awoke in something in me. And um, but mm. so later that night, so I decided to go with this energy as I was meditating, and I ended up doing. You know, it put me through all these sort of like like ritualistic things. I started, I became an elephant and a snake, and started to you know. Uh, bite my cat, you know, in really bizarre ways. And, you know, I watched myself disappear in a mirror, um, which was really bizarre. And I had, I had all these, like, really crazy things happen. Um, but, you know, it really, I, you know, several hours later, it's, oh, my God, you know, so, something is going on. Something internally is really shifting. Were you frightened that it was just more of your, you know, bipolar madness experience that was happening? Or did you kind of know to trust it as a spiritual process yeah i wasn't frightened at all um in fact i, I was it, it was i felt like i was being driven by something other than in a way um but it felt it, you know it felt very much like like right um but I, what ended up happening was the next few months um i, I meditate and started meditating every day but I, I i was hallucinating for several months where i would i would go to work and i would see auras and colors everywhere and these patterns and I was just in a different state of, of consciousness. I don't know how else to explain it. And that went on for several months. And, um, you know, eventually that sort of died down. And I knew I was going to become attached to it. And, of course, I did. So then I would meditate and I would be like, damn, where's all, where's all that great, you know, like colors? And, and I, I had to work through that or whatever. This was several years ago. But, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff happens to you. And, and I think that, you know, you – you just end up in a different place, and I, I walked out of that with, with just a, just a different sense of, of myself in, in the world, and um, yeah. But I've had things like this, you know. I've had out of body experiences before. Um, I mean, there are things. These are. It's funny. I'm talking to you about these, Will, and it would be on the radio because I never talk about this stuff with anyone. And so, if my family hears this, you know, they'll be interested in this too. But uh, but you know, I, I've I've sort of had these really bizarre visionary experiences. Ever since I was really young, I mean, when I was seven years old, I, I saw the Virgin Mary and stuff like that. But um, but as I've been an adult, I've had them too. And these are things that, you know, you can't repress. If you try and repress them, they will keep coming at you. And um, it's it's been a lot of my work has been to get back in touch with them. And and as I've done that, they've actually kind of lessened because they, they said, ah, you know, and they've shown me things. And, and then I think they've, they've kind of quieted and, a lot, you know, and, and brought me kind of closer to, to – uh, you know, consensus reality, I guess. So I wanted to ask you just about um, the kind of the dangers of meditation and spiritual experiences. I mean, there are people who kind of get into the directions that you, that who were so helpful for you, but then it kind of gets them into trouble. What, what are some of the things that you've learned in, um, in your own experiences about that, that maybe you might want to give people some, some guidelines or things to keep in mind? Well, uh, meditation for me never was dangerous in the sense of I never felt like I was going to lose touch, lose my footing with consensus reality and, and suddenly be in a place where I couldn't um, ha have insight into what was happening, at least from other people's perspective. Um, but where meditation became dangerous for me was um, it, I think we had to be very, very careful with this, especially in the West, is that it can become a, a vessel for strengthening ego as, a, as opposed to a, a wonderful way to um, dissolve it or to, to move from it. And, and um, so what I mean by that is that I, I did end up be starting to meditate where, um, you know, as you start to access these different things or I'd meditate in the woods and I would harmonize with the wind and the way that everything was moving, there can be a lot of power in that. And you can feel it and you can take it to sort of who you are and be like, wow, you know, I'm special kind of thing. And um, I've had to be very careful about that. Um, I've sort of slipped into that before. Um, and the other thing that meditation has been dangerous for me is that it can become just another uh, medication. And what I mean by that is it can become a coping skill 
um, that, that where, so if, if emotions come up, I know how to meditate to get those emotions to go away. But that's not the point. Um, if you do that, again, those emotions are going to come back at you and, and almost attack you, much like my sharks attack me. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that I've had to learn that meditation is not about you know, um, some blissful state or some uh, necessarily even clear state, but it's about coming close to what already is and to, to exploring that and acknowledging it and being with it as opposed to just, you know, um, moving around it. Yeah, it's often kind of portrayed as just this good thing that you should do, like taking your vitamins or, you know, brushing your teeth or um, going to the gym. But it's actually a lot more complicated than that. It's a whole um, realm in and of itself that has its downside and potential um, pitfalls as well. Um, are you, do you um, see a lot of people who find that meditation is really helpful for them um, in, uh, in making their way through these madness states into a uh, more of a place of recovery? Well, I see it somewhat, but I, I think more than anything what I see, and I've been trying to, to actually note that with people who ha have made you know, significant recoveries in their life, well, what are the elements you know, that, that a lot of people speak of? And just about everyone that I'll meet, and maybe this is because of the people I'm drawn to, I don't know, but we'll describe some kind of spiritual connection. So maybe not necessarily meditation, but, but prayer or just, you know, finding God um, in, in some way. But I, I think that, um, so that aspect of it I, I see a lot. Uh, meditation itself, um, I don't know. I mean, on the Icarus Project, certainly there's, there's folks that talk about it. But, you know, I, I don't know too many people um, that, that use it. In, or, yeah. <laughs> so... So what's your work um, these days? I know that you're going through a transition, and you, but you've been very much uh, involved and, and successful with the peer specialist um, movement. But what, what are you up to these days, and what's kind of the future for you? Well, I, um, I'm, I'm still, I love to write, and, and I love to collect materials and to present them. And so I'm still trying to, uh, you know, I'm researching a lot and, and still writing a lot. But I've taken um, a break from the mental health world, I'm gonna, I have another job that, that's actually going to be really wonderful, but uh, will be outside of the mental health world um, and will give me, I think, a lot of perspective on, on sort of what I want to do for my future. But I do think I want to come back into the mental health world, and I'm not sure in what capacity, but um, I know that there's a lot of people that are stuck in the system that don't have a lot of access to alternative viewpoints, that, that you know, that don't have a lot of access, you know, frankly, to... Um, to the culture at large. People, you know, there's a lot of many institutions out there. And um, I've really gotten a lot out of working with those folks. They've taught me a, a tremendous amount about myself. And um, hopefully I've shared some of my own things with them as well. And um, so that, that population I have a kind of keen interest in, in working with and being with. And so um, I don't know. I mean, I like the idea of peer-run crisis alternatives, the hospitalizations, um, and those are starting to spring up around the country, so I'll probably want to get maybe get involved in, in that kind of work and, and uh, just continue my advocacy efforts and stuff like that and, and writing and, um, and whatnot. Stephen, how can people get in touch with you and read your writings and find out more information about you and your work? Uh, there's a website I put together. Um, it, it's not really my, my viewpoints, but I just tried to be objective about it and collect information. It's, uh, it's at vermontrecovery.com. And um, some of my writings are there under articles, and there, there's a recovery brochure I, I created under What is Recovery? And, um, and then there's some curriculums that I created, uh, like a wellness curriculum um, that's on there as well. Uh, and then if people want to contact me via email, my email address is uh, Stephen with a V, Morgan, J-R, at gmail.com. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk with anyone, and I'd, I'd love to hear people's stories and, and whatnot. I, I think it gives makes this community a lot stronger. Stephen Morgan, thanks for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you so much, yeah. You've been listening to an interview with Stephen Morgan. Stephen is an activist and advocate in the mental health recovery movement. He is diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder, and he is um, also a photographer and musician. You can find out more information um, at his website, which is vermontrecovery.com. Uh, that's all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in.
You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJL PFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilof and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help us get broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.